the rule of law had broken down in Cork. The RIC had lost its capacity to tackle insurgents throughout the county. This was the reason for the arrival of a paramilitary force recruited in Britain and comprised of former officers, many of them unemployed after the war. They were known as the RIC Auxiliaries. When they arrived in Cork, few could have imagined what they were about to unleash on the city. The Auxiliaries of K Company were about to commit one of the most shocking attacks of the War of Independence. Although Cork wasn't part of the 1916 Rising, the events and developments afterwards, including an attempt to conscript Irish men into the British Army for war, and the Sinn Féin local elections of 1919, fueled nationalist fervour. A landmark event was the killing of McCartan in 1920. His replacement as IRA commander and Lord Mayor, Terence McSweeney, died on hunger strike a matter of months later. The execution of Kevin Barry and Bloody Sunday in Dublin caused even greater national tension. Back in Cork, the Kilmichael IRA ambush that killed 17 auxiliaries and three IRA men in West Cork was a seismic event on November the 28th. Colonel Gerald Smith, the Munster Police Commissioner, had issued chilling instructions to men in his division. When civilians approach, shout, hands up. Should the order not be obeyed, shoot and shoot with effect. If any persons approaching you carry their hands in their pockets or are in any way suspicious looking, shoot them down. You may make mistakes occasionally and innocent persons may be shot, but you are bound to get the right person sometimes. The more you shoot, the better I will like you. And I assure you that no policeman will get in trouble for shooting any man, and I guarantee your names will not be given at the inquest. Of the estimated 115,000 IRA volunteers during the War of Independence, 16% of them, or almost 18,000, served in Cork City. They were responsible for a fifth of the killings of RIC men and for almost a third of military fatalities. Such lawlessness didn't go unanswered by the authorities. By late 1920, gunfire was a nightly occurrence in the city, as were attacks in the countryside. After another attack on an auxiliary patrol at Dillon's Cross in Cork City on the night of December 11th, the city itself would become the latest reprisal target. Twenty men for a raid left the barracks in two motor cars. Party hadn't gone hundred yards from the barracks when two bombs were thrown at them from over a wall. One dropped in a car and wounded eight men. One has since died. Very naturally, the rest of the company were enraged. The fact that another ambush had taken place so close to the barracks, uh, such audacity, uh, I think that the auxiliaries believed that a message was being sent to them and they were going to send a message back. So th the fact that there was a response was entirely predictable and expected. The scale of the response is unique. The houses in the vicinity of the ambush were set alight. The burning and sacking of court followed immediately. We had the big run up to Christmas. You can imagine that uh, all these shops would have been decked out as well uh, in all their finery, their Christmas finery at the time. We can see by the advertisements uh, the jewellery shops were very much in vogue. You had the big department stores and of course they were selling hats and coats. First thing that they done was they, they attacked the buildings obviously. They usually took down the hoardings. There was not, not a lot of shops had hoardings over them because there had been a lot of trouble in the city previously. And they'd have broke in the windows of the buildings. More often than not, they used petrol. In some cases, they used incendiary devices. And it was just total pandemonium. They started with grants. The amount of petrol that was incredible that was actually used. And we're, we're, we're talking here about the auxiliaries. We're talking about the Black Hand Tans and some members of the RAC. The next one to be set on fire would have been the Monster Arcade. That was a Belfast firm, Robert Ledley Ferguson. So these, these were, have been seen as loyalists. These were unionists. You'd see from old pictures of the city, Union Jacks flying outside these buildings. So that will just give you an indication. It wasn't Republican buildings that were being burned. And the next one then after that was Cash's. 
I mean, th this was a big department store, a huge department store. Pandemonium must have ensued at the time. Oh, there was extensive looting. I mean, black and tans, auxiliaries that were seen, marching up and down the street with bags of loot. They had bags and bags of loot. The looting takes place first. There's a, an attempt to target shops which have, as it were, high value, low volume, uh, so things like jewellers. There's also a uh, focus on the public houses. And it's only after that point that the arson takes place. So again, this reinforces the suggestion that the acts were premeditated, the fact that petrol is, is good. The fact that there's a determined effort to prevent the fire brigade from putting out the fires again suggests that e either there was a determined effort simply to allow the, the city to burn or with the added motive of destroying any evidence. I mean, there would be an awful lot of terror in the people as well because no one knew which building was going to be fired on next. As the night wore on, there was more and more drink consumed by these people. Again, there's reports of um, black and tans with bottles of brandy in their pockets. The auxiliaries were simply determined to leave their, their mark destructive or otherwise. And they could act with impunity. Absolutely, and did act with impunity. Uh, to the extent to which any punishments took place, they were absolutely minimal in proportion to the damage that had been inflicted. I have never experienced such orgies of murder, arson and looting as I have witnessed during the past 16 days with the RIC auxiliaries. Many who witnessed similar scenes in France and Flanders say that nothing they had experienced was comparable to the punishment meted out in Cork. What began as a spree of violence and arson would lead to the complete devastation of a city, leaving its bewildered population to survey what was left of it. It wasn't acknowledged by the British administration that the black and tans were the real perpetrators. So of course the newsreels could not report that the black and tans were responsible for this fire. In fact, the newsreels more generally were reluctant to report on the bad behaviour of the black and tans because that, that was not acknowledged by the British administration. Eventually, when Hammer Greenwood acknowledged that there had been some unruly violent behaviour by the black and tans, the newsreels were then comfortable in reporting his admonishment of this behaviour.